Pele leaned in and said something to Freddie. Don't let them change you. Keep working on what makes you different and what makes you special. It was great advice, but it caused me some problems. But what could change Freddie do? Soccer is going to explode and it's going to be around this kid. We were the Beatles. Everywhere we went, it was the Freddie show. And with that came the expectation and with that came the pressure. New episodes of American Prodigy drop Tuesdays from Blue Wire Podcasts. What is up, Hardwood Knox listeners? I am Dan Favalli, coming at you without my fantastic co-host, Adam Frommel. I am, however, super excited to keep our team look-ahead train a-rolling. We're going to be covering the Atlanta Hawks and Memphis Grizzlies in depth today. For the Atlanta Hawks, who are first up, I spoke with Sarah K. Spencer. She does a fantastic job of covering the Hawks for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Follow her on Twitter at Sarah underscore K underscore Spence. Spence is spelled S-P-E-N-C-E. After we speak with her, we bring on Sharon Brown to talk all things Memphis Grizzlies. She covers the Grizzlies for the Memphis Flyer. She is also a founding editor of All Heart in Hoop City. She writes for Dime Up Rocks as well, and she's also the host of the Shy Show podcast. Be sure to follow her on Twitter, also a fantastic follow, at Sharon Shy Brown. That's at S-H-A-R-O-N-S-H-Y-B-R-O-W-N. Before we dive into these ultra-fun look-aheads, just want to remind, implore, beg, plead with everyone to continue rating, reviewing, and subscribing to us wherever you're getting your podcasts. However, even if you're not on iTunes, we really do appreciate it. If you head over there anyway, search Hardwood Knox, throw us a rating, five stars only, write that review. If it has constructive criticism, we will read it. We're always open to that constructive criticism. Most importantly, though, please just subscribe. If you're if you're new here, just listening because you're a Hawks fan or Grizzlies fan that follows Sarah or Sharon respectively, subscribe, download our episodes. You won't regret it, or at least it won't be the thing you regret most in your life. I can promise you that. Without further delay, though, let's get to the Atlanta Hawks with Sarah K. Spencer and then get to the Grizzlies with Sharon Brown. Uh, Sharon, hi. How are you doing tonight? Thank you so much for coming on the uh, Hardwood Knox podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. Um, Are you ready uh, to allow me to pick your brain to talk about the Memphis Grizzlies? Yes, go ahead. Um, I'll start with their, you know, off season in general. And we're going into this season. You still have Jaron Jackson Jr. uh, is is banged up. Justice Winslow is still banged up. Their off season overall was relatively quiet. Is it fair to say that they're not overly concerned with sort of matching? last year's finish where they were in that um, play in spot and, and had a, a chance to get to, to the postseason. It just seems from where I'm standing, like their actions um, are that of a team that's just playing the, the longer game still, even though they had some unexpected su- success last year. Well, I think they are playing the long game, but the players themselves, um, I think they want to win because they thrive off of people counting them out. That that's that that's their motto. Where when pe- they want to prove people wrong, so it's just like I think they're just gonna go out there and play and play hard every game and try to win. They don't want to lose. What if they lose? They lose. But their mindset is to try to win. It was kind of that a little bit last year too, where I think nationally they were at least just like completely written out of every meaningful conversation. And then the motor with which they played, coupled with obviously John Morant going boom, like that really made them such an interesting watch and such a threat on a night-to-night basis. Yeah, because, you know, like he says and like they say, they put their shoes on just like everybody else. And so they feel like they can compete with anybody. And then when people count some out, count them out, then boom, there they go. And then people say, well, I'm surprised of this, that, and the other. But, hey, that's their motto. They want to win regardless of if people count them out or not. John Morant coming off just an absolutely monstrous rookie season. Um, looking at that, you know, his first year for a minute, was there anything that he did that um, really surprised you or surprised you most? Well, I, you know, it's just like he he's a dog and he, he wants to win. Um, but some of those dunks, like, oh, wow. And that almost dunk against Kevin Love. Yeah. I was just like, wow. It's just like, it just seems like 
the more he played, the more he amazed you. And you you look at like, I wonder what John's going to do tonight. I wonder what he's going to do, you know, tonight. He's going to do this and do that. It, it, it was awesome. So it's I, I can say that his entire first year amazed me. And I, I, I think I'm not the only one. No, I, but personally, like, and I'm not, I don't really dive into college basketball. So I only get, I say like, I get a little higher than ankle deep around the draft. I just couldn't, I didn't know he was supposed to be such a good passer. Like, it's not just even he's a good passer. He's like a transcendent passer. And so that's something um, that was just fun to watch from him. Right. And then it's just like his court vision is like really good, you know, and just like some, some, I mean, his assist could have been higher if, you know, the players on his team actually, you know, got the buckets and everything. <laughs> yeah. It was amazing to see. Is there, uh, is there like, you know, I, I think from afar and you see it on social media, everyone gets concerned with how he lands after dunks. Like, is that an actual thing that concerns fans where they're seeing him land? Because just from my end, it's like, I get nervous every time I see him coming off the rim. Yeah. Cause I, I saw him, you know, fall a couple of times in the preseason. I was like, Oh, Oh, <laughs> you know, oh, he's all right. <laughs> I think he's learning. He they are teaching him how to um, land better, and then he put on you know a little muscle and everything. But I think he's going to be fine. Um, do you think that it's f- fair to expect kind of like another sizable leap from him after how good he was this past year? Or do you think we should probably be more prepared for just incremental improvement? Because I think it's you know the. And you, I don't even know that you could say he made a jump just because it was his first year, but him being able to surprise everyone because they weren't expecting that, um, this sort of next phase is a little harder because he's already in that stardom territory. And so to build off of that is where it gets tough. And I also feel like, though, we need to remember that this is his, his second season and, you know, defenses, they're going to be, you know, he's not going to be so new to them. Um, so do you expect like a – um I don't want like a huge jump from him this year. Would you be more on the lookout for some incremental improvement, whether that's, you know, maybe he's more consistent with his off the dribble three, taking more threes in general, whatever that may entail. Well, I think he's going to be better uh, with the three, three point shot overall, but I think he just has to, you know, take the right shots because what he did in the bubble one game, he just shot too many threes. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like, you know, that's not his game. You know, his game is going to the rim. But I think he's going to be – he's he's worked on that this offseason. But I think he's going to have a better three-point shot. But I don't think he needs to shoot, like, seven a game. You know, I don't – that's not his that's not his game right now. So I think um, he probably will get better with the three-point shot. I was surprised. I caught – I've been trying to watch not too much preseason because I'm writing – I'm doing player rankings right now. I don't want to be too influenced by them. But I caught – um, I don't even remember who he was playing, but he hit like an off the dribble three in the preseason. I was just surprised at how um, quickly he went to it. It seems like he's a lot more confident in it, but I definitely see the, um, you know, the the logic behind what you're saying, where you don't want to, you know, turn him into someone who settles because kind of at the his heart, the heart of his game is just he can create chaos when he's really inside the arc and putting pressure on the rim, and that's probably where he's going to be at his best. Right. So yeah, and uh, one shot I saw saw that he had an awkward three, you know, like he was shooting like Jaren. I was like, ooh. <laughs> Jaren's awkward, but they go in. The way he shoots it, shoots it. I was like, oh, okay. I Because I, I was wondering, like, have him and Jaren been talking or whatever? Right. Is he, like, you know, do like that? But, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm expecting his three-point shooting to be better. But I just don't, like you said, I want him, him to settle, settle for threes. You know, when he's best at going – towards the back basket you mentioned Jared Jackson Jr uh last season was it was interesting uh the way that he can score is the, just most impresses me where I think you it, you know you can just not realize he has 20 plus points per game because they feel like they're coming almost entirely within the flow of the offense I think a lot of people have already noted just like the value he brings as a shooter on the type of volume um he's taking once he is healthy this year um do you see his you know, offensive game uh, being tasked with expansion at all since this team still is kind of looking for that secondary creator or do you expect to, them to use him you know much in the same way as someone who just really changes the the shape and scope of the floor because he's stretching defenses right and then I think he they're going to use him the same but I know people want him to rebound more but it's just like he only he rebounds when he has to 
So when you have uh, uh, Jonas Valanciunas, you know, on the floor with him, Jonas get the buck of the rebound. Jaren stands out on the perimeter. Mm-hmm. And then it's just like when Jonas is not in, that's when Jaren do most of his rebounding. But to me, you know, people, we talk about small ball, we talk about this and that, but people want to judge him because he don't rebound better. But he's like the probably the best shooter they have on the on the team right now. Right. So he's up. He's just a six eleven guard. That's the way I see him. And I don't think the I don't think the rebound rebounding should matter. You know, even though he's six eleven, he's tall. But you don't expect six eleven guys to shoot that many threes like he does. Right. And so, I mean, on offense, he's definitely going to be pulled further away from the basket. So you can't expect him to do too much damage there. Do you see, I guess the main concern would be just, you know, his defensive boards, if they decide to use him at the five more so that you're not going to have um, a Jonas Valanciunas on the court with him. Do you see that as a, a lineup that they um, once again, Jackson's healthy, that they might lean on more. Do you think this team kind of views him as someone who, you know, I don't want to pigeonhole to a position, but maybe someone who always needs to, or doesn't need to, but is always going to play with another big, whether it's a Brandon Clark or a Valanciunas. Right. So it's just like, because, you know, it's like when Brandon is on the court, him and Jaren, Brandon probably get most of the re- most of the mm-hmm. rebound. But I think he's he's probably working on it to get more rebounding, but it's just like, that's just not his game. It's just not. You know, sometimes he'll get 10, sometimes he'll get one or two, but but then people, we need to look at what else he does. You know, he'll get a blocker still here or there. But it's just like rebounding. Other people get the rebound because you have guards like DeAnthony Milton is a a, a big mm-hmm. rebounder. Because you be looking at him, he's like the shortest guy on the court. And you be like, man, how did he get that rebound? <laughs> oh. it's just, because it's just like with the team, it's not just one person rebounding. You know, some of the guards, you know, they have get a lot of rebounds too, like Ja. He has a lot of uh, big rebounding numbers, so it's just a, a it's a collective thing with the team. But he 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 should get better. But I look at him as a six eleven guard, which is to me, I'm just looking at what he does on offense. That's obviously totally fair. Uh, the player that I think you know what Ja did it was it, it was the number two pick in the draft, and so yeah, it was surprising and impressive. But like those are the I guess it's easier to accept that the uh, the Brandon Clark is the younger player on the team that really caught me off guard last year, just with all the things that he could do. And I know there was some hype like leading uh, into the draft for him, but I was personally just taken aback with how much of a comprehensive impact he had. Uh, What was it about him that impressed you the most during his rookie year? Well, it's just like he, his shot, you know, with him shooting at the rim, it's just like he was really efficient. He was really efficient across the board. But I don't think he needed to shoot, you know, that many threes sometimes. And he, he was just efficient across the board. But um to me, I didn't like him in the starting lineup when Jaron was out. I mm. thought he was better suited for the bench, but he said that he's you know, he's he said that last last season he wanted to probably be on the bench more. But this season he's like open to it. You know, his second season. Mm-hmm. He's more open to, you know, playing with the starters if he has to, because I thought he was better suited to because it just seemed like he plays well with uh, DeAnthony Milson and Tyus Jones. It just seemed like they built that kind of camaraderie to make them like um, those guys contribute to like them being uh, a top five bench in the league. Yeah, I've, uh, Brandon Clark. Uh, you know, you mentioned like kind of his shooting from all over the floor. It was, I think, the big thing was his efficiency on floaters was just out of this world. And even right. Um, right. you know, you mentioned him like not maybe taking. Um, so much threes and uh, hitting them at a 35.9% clip as a rookie, even on, I, I think his three point attempt rate was below 15 or something like that was even like, mm-hmm. he was a player where it was, Oh, he was just more efficient from all over than you would have imagined. You know, that there was the floater that received so much of the attention, but he was just like across the board from basically, you know, every huge zone, um, just so efficient for them offensively. The one thing I am wondering, and it's sort of whether he comes off the bench or winds up starting at some point, do you see him and Jaron Jackson jr. As a, viable front court pairing when you're when you're looking at the defensive end yes because okay so I remember a couple of games right I don't know which game it was but when they had Jaron and um Brandon in there at the end of the game I was like oh my god all those blocks and all this and I was like wow we need this starting lineup because I think it was Ja, the Anthony 
Jaron and Brandon. I don't know which other player it was, but I was like, oh my God. Because every time, you know, like um, when they went down the floor on defense, they were blocking shots. They was doing, you know, deflections and everything. I was like, wow, well, we need, they need to um, end the game like this with these players. But, but I think uh, Brandon and Jaron are going to play really uh, great together. I will because say, of like, oh, sorry, go ahead. Close, they, uh, you know, um, doing the quarantine, like when the, the hiatus or whatever, they mm-hmm. got really closer and then they're close and they feed off each other and learn from each other. But I think they're, they're going to play very well with each other. I will say of like front courts where you would have, you know, two, like, let's say they're not traditional bigs, but two actual bigs. Um, they would have to have like just some of the best collective mobility in the league rather to uh, relative to other front courts that aren't starting, you know, like a wing at the four or even at the five right now. Right. And then you just don't know how they will fit, you know, if Justin Winslow is on the floor with them or is it Dylan Brooks or whomever, uh, Kyle Anderson, mm-hmm. just don't know. Have your impressions of that Justice Winslow trade um, changed at all, given just how banged up he's been, uh, where it seems like he's always just like so close to um, making his debut, debut, but then it never gets there. I think the um, right before the restart, like that was the one that was just, I mean, everyone was so interested to see how he would fit there because in so many ways it feels like when you look at the top of the roster, like he's exactly what they're missing. If he's the player he was in um, 2018, 2019, Um, but they did give up, you know, uh, not a ton of like asset value, but they did give up a lot of flexibility to get him. And so now you all of a sudden have to worry about not just the injuries that he's dealt with, but how those are going to impact him on the floor. And so do you think that, you know, d- dramatically increases the risk level or do you still view him as like someone who's going to be a, a really good fit with this roster? I think he's going to be a really good fit with the roster. Um, and to me, I just feel like people are too hard on players who have injuries. It's just like, Injuries is a part of sports. It's going to happen. Right. It's, it's going to happen. Um, sometimes it's fluke injuries. He was like, man, because it's like in the bubble, you know, before bubble play, he was really excited, you know, to play. He was hyped. And then, you know, the freak injury happened in practice. But I think he's, you know, he's working hard to get back. He's been working out with Jaron Jackson Jr. as well. Um, the team has a good camaraderie. And I, I think he's going to do well once he's healthy and get back on the court. I know no injuries are good, but he just seems like he's dealt with so many annoying ones over the, you know, dating back to even just before he left the heat, where it was like the hip, the back, um, and then it was the back again, and then it's the hip again. Those just seem like incredibly annoying injuries to deal with, um, especially for a wing who a lot of what he's doing on defense, like is prided on, on his mobility. And again, all injuries are bad and he could do something to his knee and that's going to hurt him just as much, but to see these hip and, back issues crop up, um, you know, twice, basically in the past two seasons, like that really does have to suck. Yeah. Yeah. It it really sucks. And, you know, it's just like, he really wants to play, but you know, and I think he just has something to prove, you know, that he's not injury prone. Like people would say that he is, you know, I just think, you know, it's a, it's a good group. And I think he's going to do well once he's healthy. Do you, how do you see him fitting with, John Morant specifically, just because the the best version of Winslow we've seen, the Heat were really giving giving him freedom to work on the ball, and so that does overlap a little bit with Ja, um, even though they do need another shot creator. So, do you see this as an instance where maybe they, you know, stagger their minutes um, a healthy amount so that he can get some run with players um, who don't need the ball as much and who he can help create for? Um, but do you think ultimately? Because I think if you want to, you know, long term, or if you want to close tight games that you're in contention to win, you probably want those two on the court because they're two of your, you know, five to seven best best players right now. Do you do you see like a clear path to them fitting together when they're both on the court? Yeah, I think it, it is because like uh, sometime last year, um, Ja he played off the ball when they had tires because they had well, if they had tires on the floor with him, and sometimes. Um, the Anthony or whatever, but I think Ja Ja is gonna adjust. He he's he's really gonna adjust. He really don't need the ball in his hand, you know. He he really doesn't. So I think if there there's gonna be adjust an adjustment, and I think they're gonna work well together. I think when you watch Ja too, which helps is you don't get like the um, just some of the other like a even a Luka Doncic vibe where it feels like he needs to be on the ball to have an impact. Um, with Ja, like you kind of get the sense that there's so much else that he could do where 
uh, you know, if he's more confident in his three point shot, there's obviously the catch and shoot three. Um, but he does have the, the size to even do damage, you know, just off cuts, just to get moving around in the half court. And so I, I would be one of the reasons that I would really like to see justice Winslow get healthy and stay healthy aside from watching justice Winslow himself would just be to see what maybe he could do to alleviate the offensive creation pressure that, that is on John Morant right now. Right, because like some of John Lobs uh last season was from Brandon Clark. So I'm um <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm I'm really hoping that uh that, that can be the same for just uh for, for just um so let's fast forward to when uh Justice Winslow is healthy. How do you kind of see the the wing rotation shaking out? Is it Winslow and Brooks are gonna be the starters? Um and then Melton's gonna maybe, you know, you look at him as a guard, but he defended up a lot last year. Um, is he kind of that first two, three off the bench? Will Desmond Bain have a role? Does Grayson Allen have a role? There's John Contra as well. It feels like um, this team is just, it has a lot of options, and I don't know that any of them are, are really sure things. So I wouldn't want to be Taylor Jenkins right now. Right. <laughs> so um, my thing is this. I think that the starters on them are going to be decided upon matchups. I think that's what I think. Because, like, last, last season – um, like doing the injuries, you didn't know who was going to start. It wasn't a set, you know, they, that the stars are based on the matchup because yes. sure you're going to have John Morant. You're going to have Jaron when he's healthy, you're going to have uh, uh, Jonas. And then like the other, the, the, the two guard and the small forward, I think those are interchangeable because sometimes he'll switch Dylan Brooks over to the small forward. So I think it's going to be interchangeable. And I think, Maybe um, Justice and Dylan would start together, and I think maybe I, I, I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> like I said, I wouldn't want to be Taylor Jenkins right now, but I think the start the start is going to be based on matchup. I I will think looking my guess would be I should say is just looking at the roster that of sort of the I think you can obviously pencil Winslow Brooks and Melton if you want to throw them into that loop too. Um, into the fold, it feels like between Bain and Allen and and Contra, like whoever maybe is able to establish themselves as more mm-hmm. reliable shooting, since that's what it would seem that this rotation does need the most are those complementary floor spacers. Yeah, and then I think I think again, it's just like sometimes who starts is really I don't know why it's, it's so important to me. Is more important is who finishes the game. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Who finishes the games? Who can if you need shooting? You know, because like uh, Taylor Jenkins, he's uh, really good at finding the people who were in the game. Because like, say, for instance, if Yona's not having a good game, he can replace him with someone else that, that's having a good game. So I think all this is based on matchups. Um, would you loop Kyle Anderson into that as well? Not obviously in the context of the, the starting lineup. Just, you know, what he does is uh, he's like kind of another layer of shot creation. But because his range is so finite on the floor, it can shrink stuff in the half court and once you have Jackson and Winslow healthy um those feel like the guys that you should want to see um you know Winslow being able to play the three four Jackson being able to play the the four five is there a chance that especially if some of these other um younger wings like if a Bain comes out and he's shooting the ball well is there a chance that Kyle Anderson would be sort of the odd man out in this wing rotation or do you think that Memphis this season is going to uh, maybe spread the you know for lack of better phrasing just like the the wealth of minutes around right that that's that's what i think, I think it's, it's every based on and on who has it going this night who has it going that night because i really think um make the rookies are really going to come off the bench like say for, say for instance if bang you know he come off the bench and then he just like he start start, start scoring like 20 points i mean yeah i mean he's going to be in the starting lineup why not <laughs> <laughs> why not but i, I think Everything is based on matchup, but it's it's pretty uh fun to see that they have um enough players to fill the roles and everybody know their role, and then it's just like they don't have any really cockiness or anything, and then they know what they're supposed to do when they play together. Uh, between is do you view or let me phrase this way: who would is more important? Do you think to this rotation, this team, this season between Melton and Brooks? They're sort of the the first two guys that the Ross um the the team is reinvested in just because Dylan Brooks is extensions kicking in. They re-signed the Anthony Melton in restricted free agency. Um, I Melton, just his defense is absolutely phenomenal, but Brooks is 
you know, from someone who's not watching nearly as much Grizzlies as you, he gives me heart palpitations with his shot selection sometimes. At the same time, like who else is supposed to generate, um, you know, offense from scratch at certain points? And it feels like he's best suited aside from John Morant to do that on this roster. And so I'm just curious as to how you look at them um, long term in terms of who means more to this team's direction. Ooh, why? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Both, can I say both? But That's fair. <laughs> Dylan, Dylan, Dylan. Woo. Okay. I'm so. not off base with that though, right? Is that like a feeling? Right, that... right, right, right. <laughs> but it's just like with Dylan, it's just like to me, this me talking, I think that he's better suited as um going to the basket with his shots. I'm okay with threes, but I just don't want him to jack up three after three after three. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But I can say that he's working on facilitating more because the two um, preseason games, the first game he averaged four, he averaged four assists. And the second game he averaged five assists. So it's just like, he's working on trying to, trying to find the open man. He's doing that more. So hopefully he will, he will be able to take the right shot because when Dylan is on, he's on, he can, he can, you know, get you 30. When he's, when he's consistent. But when he's off, you be like, Dylan, why, why, why did you shoot that? <laughs> Dylan, pass the ball. Dylan, this and that. But, you know, Dylan is a good player. But I just want him to be able to see his teammates when they're open. And I want him to just jack up a three and then clank and, you know, the other team scores. You know, especially when they're having momentum. It's just like he needs to have a better court vision of – because it's just like he just – I think all he sees is the basket at times. And I think they're working on him with that. Where he see you see an open teammate. Because you know, like, you know, with Ja, if Ja is, you know, doing certain things, he sees his open teammate, he'll give them the ball. But you know, we didn't see that with Dylan sometimes. It just seemed like he just want, you know, think he's like, you know, a Dollar Tree Kobe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a fantastic way to put it. And yeah, he does seem like, I call it like the, uh, it, it happens with Julius Randall a lot, completely different players, but they just get tunnel vision. Um, Brooks seems to be in that sort of mold, like when they're, especially when they're going downhill. And so, like I said, I've not watched, um, a ton of preseason by, by design this year, but if he's able to kind of up his or improve his decision-making, I feel like that ends up being huge for the offense. And I do think it's also fair to point out that like the role that they kind of need him to play right now it's overtaxing, I think, relative to what he's best suited for. Like, this feels like the Grizzlies are one, like, creator short to where you need to make mm-hmm. life easier on the the Meltons or the Tyus Jones or the um, Dylan Brookses because you don't necessarily want them. You're, you're trying to overextend their skill set right now. And so I think you have to be prepared when you do that for someone like Brooks, those wild swings. But as you put it, he is kind of like the consummate player that, yeah, he'll shoot you into games, but he's going to shoot you out of them too. <laughs> Right, right. But if he could get better at that, it's just like, it's not like, you know, because like some of the fans was like, well, you guys hate Dylan Brooks. It's just like, no, we just, this constructive criticism of, you know, his play. One game, he's, you know, he's a really good player. The next game, you be like, Dylan, why why, why did you do that? <laughs> you um, know? You- you kind of, yeah, you, you kind of mentioned this before, too, um, that this team is built to play matchups, and I'm sure they're, you know, the way that they structure their closing lineups in tight games will reflect reflect this. But what do you see as their most common closing lineup, or do you identify, even if you want to take it this route, you know, two or three players that you just know are going to be in um, every single closing unit? We know John Morant is one of them, and I would assume Jaron Jackson is too, but it feels like the Grizzlies have a lot of options um, in – for how they're going to flesh out those, those cloning, those, excuse me, those closing units when they need to. But I, I just think, uh, like you said, Jaron and Ja, but who knows who the other three players are going to be. I'm I'm just being honest because it's just like, you just, I, I have to wait. Cause like with me, I don't like to predict things, you know, per se, because I just don't know what's going to, you know, happen. Because like I said, one of the rookies could, you know, be really good. And, you know, they're in a the closing lineup, but, um, and Brandon Clark, he he could be in a closing lineup, and then sometimes Jonas could be in a closing lineup. So I, I just I just don't know. Is is there a unit then that you would independent of crunch time, whatever that you just want to see the Grizzlies play? Maybe a quirky five man combination, one that Jenkins might not immediately think to 
to deploy. Like if you were just to put on your coach's hat right now and you could roll out any five um, combination of, of players here for Memphis, what would you, what do you want to see at some point this season tested out? Okay, I want to see um, Ja, Jaron, Justice, Brandon Clark, and maybe Dylan or DeAnthony. Uh, that's a lot. Of, yeah. With Dylan, that's a lot of offensive versatility in that unit. That should be like an offensive right. firecracker. I, and I, Dylan was really good at de- uh, on the defense as well. So. I would like to see if they're ever going to play um, Jackson at the five. I'd like to kind of see what the partnership looks like with uh, Justice Winslow as sort of the four guy in that situation. Mm-hmm. Because he had a lot of success with that in my Miami. And that makes you, um, I think, a little more dynamic on offense without really sacrificing anything on the defensive end. I know people are, have noted that like they don't view um, Jackson as being on the all defense track that he was sort of billed as coming into the league. One, it's only been a couple seasons, but two, I think he's, you know, he's not like completely overmatched playing the five. And so if you're, if you have two like solid options, at least up front there and yeah, fouling could become an issue between the two of them in those spots. I would just kind of like to see Morant running point in that situation, obviously. And you could really flesh out the wing spots, how you would at the two, three in any way. I would just like to see that sort of, three-man combination and how it works with uh Jackson at the five Winslow at the four and Ja as as the one yeah that 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 would be pretty cool and it's just like who knows who could be at the two and three yeah like I mean we've we've talked about a, a bunch already they just have so many different options that are all basically worth testing out like I'm not a, like super into Grayson Allen's game but he shot the ball oh, yeah. really well yeah, at points was, last year I was just thinking about that when before you said something I would want Grayson in there too because, like, when Grayson on with them threes, because like he was in a bubble, you know, he was healthy. He can shoot the three too, so I would probably would want him um, in the closing lineup, you know, over Dylan, maybe sometimes. Just maybe. Yeah, I uh, know. I mean, that would make total sense. Um, and it, again, it, it's such an elite. If he's hitting threes consistently, that's a just a, a big boon for the offense, and it does a lot for the spacing that John Morant is working with because he creates just under utter anarchy when he's uh, working off the dribble inside the arc what and you, the going, oh, go ahead the sorry joke, the going joke in the bubble is like we said that Grayson got a a, a haircut from a black barber and, and <laughs> that's why he was shooting that well so you know we need some of the black barbers in Memphis to hook Grayson up look all I'm saying is if he comes out in the first game of the regular season and shoots like two of eight or something then that absolutely needs to happen right um, <laughs> And so what would you view, and you could factor this in however you like, if you're expecting major changes, if you're not, what do you view as sort of a realistic win total and Western Conference finish for this team? I know their over-under most recently has been set at 30.5, which for people like myself who cannot think in 72-game terms, that's the equivalent of a 35-win season, um, which is you know slightly, I think they were, they were on a 39-win pace last year, so that's, that's off that pace a little bit. Uh, would you take over or under on, on that type of mark? If, if they're being pegged as um, a 35-win team in a normal season, would you expect fewer or more victories than that from them? Um, it all depends. I think it'd probably be more um, more than 35. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say probably about 40, maybe. Mm-hmm. Because it's like the West is so tough, but it's just like, I really don't know. The West is so tough. They were when I did. Oh, I want to. You wonder how um, Golden State is going to be. You know, with yeah. wonder how the Rockets are going to be because you don't know if James Harden going to be there. Yeah, they're imploding. To be there, you just <laughs> but you you just don't know. And I just think because like last season, you know, they was pre- pre- predicted to be wild on the barrel, and before you know the hiatus, you know, they were the eight seed, and then like you know, they. They, you know, achieved, you know, it's just like um, people thought they was going to be at the bottom of the barrel and then they overperformed, you know, basically. Mm-hmm. So it's just like I don't want to give a number per se, but right. I think, okay, so to me, honestly, I think they can finish between 7 to 12. That's me being honest. That's what I think they, they will be at, between 7 to 12. As you know, it's going to be play-ins this time and then Maybe they can be one of the teams to overtake, you know, the seven or eight spot. 
Yeah, I've had, I have not, like, I've had trouble thinking about the postseason in those terms. I keep forgetting that now that you're, if you're 10th, like, you have a, a real chance to get in the playoffs, and that changes, I'm sure, what teams do in the middle of the season. And you really touched upon, like, the mental tug of war for myself. When I was doing a win predictions podcast earlier, I picked the under for Memphis because of how brutal the West mm-hmm. is. Um, like, I mean, you, you mentioned some of these teams, like even just the ones that are like Phoenix is just going to be exponentially better because of right. um, getting Chris Paul. Uh, but the thing that made me not feel the least bit confident in that pick is because we ascribe so much value to, if you have like that North star building block, and if they can be a top 25 player at any given point, the value that they really inject into that team and the Grizzlies have that player. And so then I find myself wondering if, you know, if I'm saying they're going to win under the equivalent of 35 games, I find, I'm wondering if I'm just not assigning enough value to what John Morant can do because I don't know that I expect him to get a lot better, but he's going to just be better. And he just had one of the most efficient, high-volume scoring seasons among rookies in, in league history. And so I am in full agreement with you that I think their um, range of outcomes in the West, probably like every other team, is is pretty wide. And I certainly wouldn't write them out of the playing conversation. I will say that I think if they do miss, um, let's say 10th uh, by a substantial margin, if it's not be due to injuries, my, my guess would then be that it's okay. Well, then this team decided to steer kind of out of the playoff picture this year. And there were some subsequent trades made. Right. But I, I you know, it's just like the Grizzlies, it's like they try to get like um, players who suit the team, you know, high IQ and it's not going to be a problem in the locker room. Um, so I, I just don't know how the trade thing is going, going to be. And then I forgot to, you know, Gorgie, uh, Gorgie, uh, Dang is still on the roster and, um, who knows what he's going to do. You know, sometimes he can shoot the three pretty good. He can rebound good. So I, I just don't know who the, um, what's going to happen, but I'm hoping that the bench, you know, would be a better bench like they were a good bench like they were last season. Cause like I said, they were top five, top five. Yeah, and I am. Uh, I was okay. I was really high on Gorgie Jang when he was in Minnesota. Like right when he signed his extension, I thought he was going to end up being like really good, and he's kind of faded into the backdrop. But for you know, when you're looking at like the center spot and just, mm-hmm. I don't know that he makes the best decisions on defense. He's just super mobile and can do a lot of different things. Any space is the floor for you on right. offense a little bit too. Um, so you do see him factoring into to the rotation then. Yeah, I, I, I do. Like especially you know as far as the bench goes, I, like I say it. They have so many pieces, you know. Even Jonte could, Porter, yeah. Right. They have so many pieces that could fit in. We just don't know. And then, like I said, you know, Bane, he could, like, you know, start hitting, like, seven threes a game, you know, five <laughs> threes a game. And that could help, you know, that could help out. So it's it's, it's just, like, for me, it's just a wait and see, you know, what what's going to happen with this team. But I know they're going to be fun to watch. I think John Morant – by himself automatically makes you no lower than a top seven team to watch. Right. <laughs> it's going to be really fun to watch. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk? Maybe something that's undercovered about this team from a national perspective, any spicy, you know, Xavier Tillman takes or anything along those lines? No, no, not, not, not nothing spicy. I just, you know, people just shouldn't count them out just because, you know, things look good on paper. But until you actually start playing in games, you know, look look what happened, you know, with the Clippers last season and look at look what happened with the Heat. You know, a lot of people was like, well, um, Jimmy Butler shouldn't have signed with the Heat and look what happened with that team. You have people, you have guys that's gonna play hard and you know, there's no egos or anything like that, and mm-hmm. they know their roles, they could go far. Uh, the Clippers certainly wish that they didn't play the games in the bubble, that they were just awarding championships based on, on paper. Uh, right. The one thing I did want to ask you, though, that I forgot to mention was, do you see this team being um, noticeably better on, on the defensive end this year now that some of these guys have just a little bit more experience under their belts? Or do you think that their identity is going to end up sort of being – uh, defined on on the offensive end um, mostly this season because you know last year they were um, I was shocked like they finished 15th in defensive efficiency which is just really good but when you look at their roster to me I feel like this year they're almost set up to be probably better offensively than they are defensively and I was just curious as to what your thoughts were on that uh, I think they could be better on defense so I was watching the bubble game you know, I mean not the bubble game the preseason game mm-hmm. 
I'm like, you know, they was like, I don't know if Minnesota was like just a bad team or was they defense, you know, was on. Because he was like, wow, why? I'm like, they was playing really hard. I'm like, uh, this is a preseason game. It don't, you know, it don't matter. <laughs> why y'all playing this hard? Because like I said, I don't know if it's, you know, that's how their defense is going to be or if just Minnesota just a bad team. Um, Minnesota is going to be a bad team, but I'm I'm very interested to track their defense because they I wouldn't have even pegged them as like a, a league average defense last year. And, and they were sort of right there. And now you have, you know, John Morant is, is a sophomore. He's not a rookie. And D'Anthony Melton has been in a regular rotation for another year. So 15 feels like at once like that's a, a look. A league average defense is hard when you don't when you're dealing with uh, sort of a developmental situation. Uh, but the fact that they were there last year and then didn't really make any changes, and if Justice Winslow comes back, that in theory only amplifies your defense. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something with this team that I think I'm going to be drawn to all year. Oh, okay. Another thing that I wanted to talk about was Jonas Valanciunas. He's, like, becoming a good facilitator. You know, um, they were – you know, they wanted him to do that. Uh, I think in one of the bubble games or whatever, he did that. And then he – you know, I saw him getting some assists during the preseason – so I'm hoping that um, it'll be something he continues to do. Yeah, he's – and I think with traditional bigs, like they just get typecast too easily now or written mm-hmm. off as, oh, they're not versatile enough. He does right. – you know, if he's going to improve his passing, like he already does so many different things, like getting you buckets in the post. He's a good role man. He's expanded his his jumper. He's like a pretty – you know, you're not going to trust him to go out and guard in space, but he can be right. a pretty good rim protector. So he's like really – solid for this team and if you're don't you know if you're trying to not be like if you're trying to be competitive um i don't know if he i don't know if he can be the center on a championship team but if you're trying to be a competitive good for, uh, above average basketball team in the nba he's he's a legitimate starting center and i think that continues to even when he was in toronto it was the same thing it felt like that was kind of lost on people right and then it's just like he you know he he you know he needs a, a better role role but i you know they talked to him about you know doing doing you know um <clears throat> get more assists and, you know, kind of facilitate a little bit. And I think he likes that. And I think he's going to do a whole lot better this season. Yeah, it would be interesting to me is that if they, you know, maybe he's still starting, but you give him like a quicker hook and you kind of put him out against um, bench heavier lineups and you can just let him, if he's going to be able to facilitate, um, let him brutalize them on the block and he can pass and he can he can score. Right. Um, that might be a role that he's really suited for right now. Yeah, because like the last game, the last preseason game against Minnesota, he had 22 points, five assists, and four rebounds in 24 minutes. That's a pretty good line. Right. Because, you know, he has two assists shy of uh, of job. So if he gives, you know, assists like that, yeah, that's that's going to be another thing he can uh, put in his back. Uh, that's another part of his game that he has. So I, I really like that. Um, this was awesome. Thank you so much for, for coming on, Sharon. I really appreciate it. If you guys aren't following her on Twitter, I would recommend Remy, remedying that post haste. Um, she can be found at Sharon Shy Brown. That's at S H A R O N S H Y B R O W N. She is the Grizzlies beat writer for the Memphis Flyer, founding editor of All Heart in Hoop City. Um, she writes for Dime Up Rocks, and she is the host of the the shy show podcast. She, she wears many hats and, and wears them. Well, um, thank you again so much for coming on and I'm sure I will be bothering you again in the future. Yeah. I appreciate you. And I need to have you to come on or come on the shy show too. Look, whenever you need terrible basketball takes, I'm your guy. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>